Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, and in Vancouver, at his home, is Matthew Stockton. Hello, Matthew. How are you today? C'est moi. I'm good. So, we fixed my microphone, which was yes. good. Yeah. I'm worried that our listeners don't get to hear me do the countdown when the numbers come up on the screen. They don't get to hear you do the countdown. It's so exciting. So we have this technology where on the screen it's like five, four, three, two, one, and then we're live. And and Matthew has to say the numbers because he's... Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm special. <laughs> you're, you're definitely special. <laughs> The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. On July 9, 1928, the Alberta Provincial Police were alerted to a mass murder at the Boer Farm in Manville, Alberta. Upon arrival, they discovered the bodies of Rose Boer, her eldest son Fred, and two hired hands, Gabriel Gromby and Bill Rozak, all shot dead. The younger Boer... The younger Boer son Vernon was unharmed. He'd been... He said he'd been out in the fields working that evening and, after hearing shots, ran back to the house to find his mother and brother dead. It was he who'd sounded the alarm. Two Boer daughters were in town during the incident, so were also unharmed, and the father of the family, Henry, was also away during the killings. Henry and the girls were devastated, but Vernon displayed little emotion and soon became the number one suspect in the slayings. He denied any involvement, and the murder weapon, a rifle, was missing. Dr. Adolf Maximilian Langsner, an Austrian criminologist and psychiatrist who claimed he could read brainwaves, was brought in to assist. He claimed he read Vernon's mind and confirmed he was the killer. Langsner also directed police to the missing firearm, claiming he'd drawn a map taken from Vernon's thoughts. Presented with the missing rifle, Vernon confessed, stating he killed his mother over her disapproval of a love interest and then eliminated the others as witnesses to his crime. But his confession was disallowed. Why? His defense attorneys claimed Dr. Langsner had coerced him into confessing via hypnotism. This is Dark Poutine episode 286, The Mind Reader and the Murderer, The Boer Farm Massacre. In the 1920s, rural Alberta was a landscape of transformation and tenacity. Having joined the Canadian Confederation in 1905, the province was still in its infancy, and the pioneering spirit of its inhabitants marked its rural areas. The decade began under a shadow of an economic downturn 
particularly challenging for farmers due to plummeting grain prices in the aftermath of World War I. This economic strain was juxtaposed with the promise of prosperity as Alberta's vast tracts of land beckoned settlers with the allure of fertile soil and the potential for agricultural success. The Canadian Pacific Railway played a pivotal role in this era, facilitating the movement of people and goods and shaping the development of many rural communities. Traditional farming was the backbone of the rural economy, with wheat being the predominant crop. However, the decade also saw the beginnings of diversification, with some farmers venturing into cattle ranching and other agricultural pursuits as wheat prices were volatile. Socially, Rural communities were tight-knit and often centered around local churches, schools, and community halls. These venues became the heartbeats of their locales, hosting social gatherings, dances, and meetings. Despite the challenges, the 1920s in rural Alberta was a testament to the resilience and determination of its people laying the groundwork for the province's future growth. Manville, where this story takes place, is a typical rural Alberta town. It is a quaint village located in the county of Minburn, number 27, in east-central Alberta, Canada, approximately 170 kilometers east of Edmonton and 22 kilometers west of Vermilion. It's strategically positioned along Highway 16, a segment of the Yellowhead Highway. Additionally, its proximity to the junction of Highway 881 provides access to northern Alberta, The origins of Manville trace back to the late 19th and early 20th centuries when pioneers began settling in the area. Its establishment as a hamlet in 1905 coincided with the construction of the Canadian Northern Railway, which played a pivotal role in the town's development. The settlement was named for Sir Donald Mann, the railway's vice president. The railway provided the necessary transportation link for settlers and goods fostering regional growth. I found this interesting that nobody in this story is Ukrainian because yeah. the re- Ukrainian population back then in places like Manville was was really big. Um, yeah. A lot of the Ukrainians had come over because of the availability of land for farming and they, br- mm-hmm. they brought that agricultural knowledge and skills, um, like especially with wheat farming, that adapted to the Canadian prairies. Right. The Ukrainians really transformed the region. Even to this day, like if, if you see how, like Ukraine in Europe, we call the breadbasket of Europe. Mm-hmm. And even now with Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, you see on the news sort of the back and forth about wheat shipment. So it's still so fundamental to, to Ukrainian culture and society. And in Canada, the Ukrainians really sort of gave a good kickoff to wheat production. They definitely did. It, we should get back to it too, because it would make sense right now with the way things are. Yeah. The well-off Boer family had come to Alberta from Oklahoma in 1906 eventually settling near Manville in 1924. They owned a farm just north of the village and were known as good, honest, hard-working folks. Henry Boer, 50, and his 44-year-old wife, Eunice, had four children. Their oldest, Fred, was 25, Vernon was 21, Dorothy was 19, and Algertha was 17. They had two hired hands who also lived in their farm's small mobile bunkhouse, a young man named Wazil, or Bill, Rozak from Poland, and another named Gabriel Gromley. July 9, 1928 was an ordinary day that would end most tragically for the Boer family. In the morning, Henry set out early to a piece of land he'd just bought around 10 kilometers away. He was looking to build a new house there and expected to be away for a week as he surveyed the land for the best place to build and available resources. He believed his farm was in capable hands with his boys and hired hands tending to the work while he was away. That evening at around 6 p.m., Dorothy and Algertha left on horseback for basketball practice in Manville at the local school. As they left, they spotted their mother returning from picking strawberries with a basket full of berries. The the remaining men on the busy farm were still working. Bill Rozak and Fred tended tended to farm chores in the Westfield. Gabriel Gromley 
was occupied in the East Field across Manville Road. It's interesting that they're playing basketball. Yeah. I was like, really? Basketball in this small village back then? And then I remember that basketball was invented by Canadian. His name was James Naismith, Mm -hmm. but he started it in Springfield, Massachusetts. But he came back to Canada and introduced it here, and it took off really quickly, right? Right. Yep. Here's a fun fact. I've always liked this fact. The original game used real fruit baskets on a pole without the bottoms cut out so players had to climb up a ladder every time they they uh they p- put one in the net if you will and needed to get the ball out and eventually somebody had the bright idea of hey let's cut a hole in the bottom so we don't have to waste time the initial basketball games were played using the baskets of i think it was nay smith's landlady and she she would have been angry <laughs> <laughs> she's she's like where are all my baskets why are my baskets have no bottoms <laughs> as the girls left the property they passed by their brother vernon near a gate near the north pasture of the property a colt escaped from the gate before vernon could close it after his sisters and he had to chase it down to return it shortly after the girls left they were around 200 meters from home when they heard a couple of gunshots They were far from startled by the sounds. There had been many foxes sneaking around the Boer property at the time, and perhaps someone had finally taken a pot shot at one or two. Further on, they passed Will Scott's horse and buggy. He was on his way to the farm to drop off a tax notice to Henry on behalf of the municipality. When Mr. Scott arrived at the Boer place, he saw Vernon pacing back and forth in front of the house. Scott dismounted and approached the house, but was waylaid by Vernon before he got to the door. Vernon said he could take the notice, his father wasn't home, and his mother was busy. The pair talked briefly about the taxes due. Will Scott didn't see anything unusual in Vernon's demeanor. As Will and Vernon chatted, Bill Rozak emerged from the barn, and Vernon curtly ordered the hired hand go feed the pigs. Rozak complied and went off toward the granary to gather pig feed. On his way off the property, Will Scott saw Bill Rozak, bucket in hand, doing as he'd been told. Mr. Scott was some distance away from the farm when he heard gunshots, around five or six. He didn't think it was unusual either. At the time, he thought maybe someone was shooting cans or had discovered a predator out to steal a chicken or two. As no neighbors later admitted to firing a weapon that evening, Will Scott likely heard the sounds of murder. Other neighbors, the Ross family to the west, had heard shots. Sound carries across the prairies. It was around 30 minutes after that, sometime after 8 p.m., when Vernon Boer burst through the door of the Ross home, claiming he'd found his brother Fred and his mother laying on the floor. He said they were dead, that someone had shot them. He implored Robert Ross to call the police and a doctor. Before he ran out the door toward home, Vernon asked for someone to contact Henry, his dad, as well. While Vernon was still at the Ross place, Dorothy and Algertha arrived home. They were worn out from their exercise and subsequent ride home and were looking forward to bathing and getting some rest. The sight that greeted the sisters as they walked through the kitchen door was horrific. The pair were first met with the body of their eldest brother, Fred. He had no pulse. His face was a bloody mess. A closer look showed he'd been shot. Eunice... Their mother was at the table close by, slumped forward into the strawberries she'd been shelling. She too had been shot once in the back of the head. The local doctor, Harley Heeslip, was the first official to arrive on the scene. The sisters were distraught, but Vernon, as we mentioned, was oddly emotionless. Henry, who'd been told to rush home after being told something terrible had happened at the farm, soon arrived. Alberta Provincial Police Constable Fred Olson arrived at 11.15 p.m. The doctor and police constable took in the scene. Eunice Boer had not seen it coming. Her killer had shot her point-blank in the back of the head, blowing it apart. The dishes that somebody had been washing were in the sink beside Fred's body. Investigators presumed he'd had his back to his mother, was startled by the gunshot that had killed her, and turned around. Someone shot him in the face three times as he turned, killing him instantly. Three bullets were unnecessary overkill. Whoever had shot Fred did so with anger. Had the killer snuck into the house undetected? That seemed impossible, given Fred's position. He'd surely have noticed a stranger coming through the door beside him. Was the killer already in the house, or was he someone they expected to see there? 
A further inspection of the property by an armed search party consisting of concerned neighbors uncovered more carnage. Face down on the bunkhouse floor, they found Gabriel Gromby's corpse. Like Eunice and Fred Boer, Gabriel had been shot to death, hit three times in the neck, jaw, and chest. The doctor determined he'd died sometime after Fred and Eunice. No one knew where Bill Rozak was for the moment. It was briefly considered he might be the killer, but a search of the barn revealed he was dead, also shot to death. Upon examining the crime scenes, Constable Olson deduced that the killings were executed using a high-powered rifle. Olson gathered statements from all those present and then instructed everyone to leave, retaining only Town Constable Gordon Milligan and Holborn T. Taylor, the editor of the Manville News. Olson found Vernon's demeanor peculiar. During a private conversation inside the house with Eunice Boer's severely mutilated body in sight, Olson observed that Vernon's hands were unusually clean for someone who claimed to have been working throughout the day. This raised the question. Amid the chaos, when had Vernon found the time to wash his hands? Additionally, Vernon seemed unemotional even when confronted with the sight of his deceased mother. Upon being asked about his emotional state, Vernon responded that the situation didn't disturb him. When questioned about firearms in their home, Vernon mentioned a shotgun and a 22 caliber rifle, both stored in a back bedroom. Olson located these weapons exactly where Vernon indicated. Both firearms were covered in dust, indicated they hadn't been used recently, and the shotgun was also damaged. Its broken hammer meant it was essentially useless without repair. Neither weapon matched the injuries on the victims. However, Vernon later revealed that occasionally the men in his family would borrow a 303 rifle from either Mr. Ross or Mr. Stevenson for hunting or beef slaughtering purposes. On July 10th at dawn, Constable Olson began a detailed search of the Boer farm with Gordon Miller, Holborn Taylor, and Vernon Boer present. In the bunkhouse, sunlight revealed two bullet holes, with one containing a fragment from a 303 rifle bullet. Despite searching, Olson found no bullet casings outside, suggesting the shooter had retrieved them. Inside the farmhouse, Olson inferred that Eunice Boer was shot at close range with a bullet grazing the kitchen table and hitting the front door. A dishpan in the kitchen concealed a 303 rifle shell casing. It looked like the killer had missed one. When Olson showed this to Milligan and Taylor, a curious Vernon approached them, but Olson discreetly hid the casing. Throughout, Vernon seemed to be closely observing the investigation. Olson identified an overlooked gunshot wound on Bill Rozak's abdomen in the barn. He estimated nine shots were fired in total in the whole affair, but only one shell casing had been found. Later, Detective Sergeant Frank Leslie and two officers arrived. After being briefed and inspecting the crime scene, Leslie interviewed Vernon. Vernon recounted his activities from the previous day, including hearing gunshots while searching for cows. However, Leslie noticed inconsistencies in Vernon's account. Feeling Vernon was withholding information, Leslie probed deeper. Vernon mentioned a dispute involving two Hungarian strangers and Fred, but denied any family discord, even noting he had loaned money to Fred. Henry Boer countered this when he later said that there had been some bad blood between Vernon and Fred that summer, but he hadn't thought it was serious. Henry had decided that, with the upcoming move to the new farmstead, he would leave the current one to Fred, which had apparently upset Vernon. On hearing of the decision the month before, Vernon had taken off in his car, but soon came home seemingly less upset. Four dead people in one event was definitely newsworthy and disturbing. The people of Manville and surrounding communities were concerned that a madman was on the loose. To calm community concern, Police released a statement saying that they believed the murders on the Boer farm were isolated and that there was no need to worry. They already had suspicions but were unwilling to give any further details at that point. Another neighbor, Charles E. Stevenson, told Alberta Provincial Police that his 303 rifle was missing from his home. Stephen mentioned that Fred Boer had borrowed his 303 rifle the previous fall and returned it in the spring along with some ammunition. Stevenson stored the additional shells in a cupboard behind the dishes at his home. Only a few people knew of this stash, including Fred, Vernon Boer, his current, and a former hired hand. He realized the rifle and the box of shells were missing only when asked to present them after the murder. On the Sunday preceding the murders, 
Stevenson's family was out from the morning until the early afternoon, leaving their home unlocked. Despite the somewhat secluded location of this property, Stevenson hadn't noticed any unfamiliar faces around. Detective Sergeant Leslie had discovered a cartridge with four 303 cartridges in the Boer home, but there was no sign of the firearm. Detective Leslie tracked down and spoke with the two Hungarians that Vernon had suggested as suspects who might have had a motive for killing Fred, but both men provided airtight alibis. This left only Vernon Boer, as everyone else who could have possibly done it, had alibis. He was the only one around the property that night who wasn't dead. After learning from villagers that Vernon had mentioned hating his mother for nagging him and even talking about killing her, Frank Leslie took Vernon Boer into custody. More after a quick break, but first, here's that Supernatural Circumstances promo, because, damn it, I want you to listen to that show. We put a lot of work into it. Anyway, here it is. Hey, Dark Poutine listeners, Mike here. Are you ready to dive deep into the mysteries of the supernatural? Join me and award-winning paranormal researcher Morgan Knudsen as we dissect chilling phenomena on supernatural circumstances. From spine-tingling hauntings to creepy cryptids and other paranormal subjects, we'll be your guides on this extraordinary journey. We're in Season 2 right now, so there are plenty of episodes for you to catch up on. Buckle up and explore the unknown with us and numerous expert guests. Download Supernatural Circumstances wherever you podcast. Matthew, we are back. Uh, any thoughts on this episode so far? Uh, I used a picture of this gentleman in right before the comments here so you could see what he looked like. Yes, and I don't want to objectify a murderer, but he was hot. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's a tall, young, strapping uh, farm guy. So Yeah, he was he was quite handsome. But what I was thinking was, you know, this is like 1928, right? Yes. And back in back in 1928, like 90% of Canada's population, which is only about 10 million at the time, lived in rural communities. And yeah. today, 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 that's gone down to 18%. Wow. And there were like 700,000 people in Alberta at the time, and most of those were in small communities like, like Manville. So people really depended on each other and knew each other back then. Right. And a brutal mass murder like this back then in a small community, mm -hmm. even now it's sort of extreme. Back then it would have been such an extreme, massive thing, right? Yeah. And I can imagine the community would be completely on edge until the murderer was found. Oh, yep. They absolutely were. While Vernon was being held in a makeshift cell at the Manville Fire Hall, the police began a massive search for the missing firearm employing dozens of volunteer neighboring farmers to scour the area around the Boer farm and beyond. A public coroner's inquest was held in Manville, presided over by provincial coroner E.A. Braithwaite. Vernon Boer was one of the witnesses called, and he told his version of the events. Commonly called Bunny by friends and family, Vernon was a composed witness. He was tall for his age, well-dressed, and delivered his testimony confidently. On the evening of the incident, he said his mother informed him about some horses on their property. He attended to the horses and mended the fence, returning home when Councillor Scott arrived with a tax receipt at around 7.15 p.m. He looks like a bunny. He looks like a bunny. Okay, interesting. I don't get it. Like, I look at him and I think, okay, he's a tall young guy, but why bunny? <laughs> I'd call him bunny. No one's around to uh, explain it to us. <laughs> Why would you call him Bunny, Matthew? N never mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> After instructing Bill to feed the pigs, Vernon said he checked on the cattle further afield. During this time, he said he heard gunshots prompting him to return home. Upon his return, he discovered multiple bodies and raised the alarm at the Ross residence. He identified the victims had been shot due to the visible blood. He heard the initial gunshots around 7.20, he said, and subsequent shots approximately 25 minutes later. 
It took him about 45 minutes to return home after hearing the shots. Vernon mentioned that hearing gunshots during that season wasn't unusual, so it hadn't really startled him. When asked about his emotional state amid the scene, Vernon responded nonchalantly that he was fine and unaffected. The inquiry determined what everyone already knew. According to the Edmonton Journal on July 18, 1928, the verdict returned by the jury after about a half an hour's deliberation was as follows, quote, Taking into consideration the position of the bodies when discovered, the course of the bullets as described by Dr. Bell, and the other evidence submitted by various witnesses, the jury came to the conclusion that four persons, namely Eunice Boer, Fred Boer, Gabriel Gromby, and Bill Rozak, were willfully murdered and met their death as a result of gunshot wounds inflicted by some person unknown on the 9th of July, 1928, at the Boer homestead, Fred Boer's place. End quote. Immediately after the verdict, Vernon, the only remaining Boer's son, was charged with the four killings. Frank Leslie would be the prosecutor at the preliminary hearing set for the next day. Vernon said that he would defend himself despite his family's ability to pay for legal representation. There's that old saying, a person who represents themselves in court has a fool for a client. Absolutely. We see this a lot, actually, with narcissists, too. Like, they, they don't want anybody else to have any say in their fate. You know what I mean? They don't trust that anyone can do anything better than they can. Maybe maybe the expression should be a person who represents themselves in court has, has a narcissist for a client. Yeah, <laughs> that would <laughs> probably be a better one. The hearing occurred at the local Orange Hall, packed to the rafters with locals while P.G. Pilkey presided as the judge. In the police case presented by Frank Leslie, Vernon was accused of murdering his mother shortly after his sisters left for Manville. He allegedly shot her from behind as she sat at the table. He was also accused of shooting his brother Fred, which was the gunshot Algertha reportedly heard. The case suggested by the time Will Scott arrived with a tax notice and Bill Rozak returned from the fields, both Eunice and Fred were already dead. This painted Vernon as a cold-blooded killer who could discuss taxes right after committing such heinous acts. After Scott left, Vernon was believed to have shot Rozak in the barn and later killed Gabriel Gromley in the bunkhouse. Gunshots heard by neighbors supposedly corroborated these acts. The suspected murder weapon was a missing 303 Ross rifle from Charles Stevenson's home. Witnesses claimed to have seen Vernon near the Stevenson farm the Sunday morning before the murders. However, Dorothy Boer, Vernon's sister, countered this by stating Vernon had visited the Austins that day, which was the opposite direction. So it, it looks like he took that old saying uh, to heart, uh, two things are sure in life, death and taxes. Oh dear. How do you do that? Like, how cold is that? Your mother and brother are laying dead inside and you're having a chat with the tax guy, you know? I guess if you did it in you're, quote, trying to appear normal, mm -hmm. right? Or just trying to, oh, the tax man was coming. I, I should still have the meeting with him, right? Right. Leslie's case was primarily based on circumstantial evidence. Vernon, appearing confident in court, effectively cross-examined witnesses and highlighted inconsistencies in their testimonies. While Leslie tried to establish a motive by suggesting Vernon's hatred for Fred stemming from a prior argument, this was refuted by their father, Henry, who emphasized that Vernon had always been the favored son. Observers felt that Leslie's case lacked strength. The mere argument between the brothers seemed an insufficient motive for Vernon to commit multiple murders, especially without the discovery of the alleged murder weapon. Now, why would his father say that uh, he was a favored son? Yeah, that's, it's unusual, but I can see what his motive might have been at this time. His son is most likely going on trial for his life, and if he's found guilty, he's going to be hung. So you're not going to offend Fred, who's already gone. So Fred's dead. Yeah, Fred's dead. So you can say that to save Vernon's life, I guess. Okay. I wonder if I was dead, my family would say my brother's the favorite son. Maybe the truth. You've met my brother. You, you can probably see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> According to the Times Colonist newspaper on July 19, 1928, Magistrate Pilkey determined that Vernon Boer should stand trial for the murder of his mother, brother, and the two farmhands. Pilkey said, quote, 
While the evidence is wholly circumstantial and contains several discrepancies as to time, still suspicion is directed toward you, and I do not feel I should take upon myself the responsibility of liberating you, and therefore I must commit you for trial on the information laid against you. I can only hope you may be able to prove yourself innocent. End quote. Vernon denied the charges. Up to this point, the story reads like any other multiple murder case. It was here that things took a strange turn. An odd-looking little man was in the audience during the preliminary hearing. People assumed he was a journalist as he appeared to be listening intently, writing everything down in a notebook and intermittently staring at Vernon Boer. The man was no newspaperman. His name was Adolf Maximilian Langsner, and he claimed he was, among other things, a criminologist and a mentalist who could read people's minds. Langsner said he was Austrian, from a wealthy family, and also a medical doctor. The 35-year-old was touring Canada then, and when the Alberta Provincial Police got wind of his being in the country, Commissioner Bryan, a fan of Langsner's, invited him to help with the case. Langsner claimed he could use his special abilities to help police find the murder weapon and would be able to obtain a confession from the killer by reading his mind. Langsner said he had studied psychology under the guidance of the renowned Sigmund Freud in Vienna. After earning his doctorate, he furthered his education in France and Scandinavia before embarking on an expedition to the East. He studied yoga and the art of controlling bodily functions in India through sheer willpower. He claimed to have mastered hypnosis, telepathy, and other techniques in mountain monasteries near Calcutta, enabling him to interpret waves emitted by human consciousness. Ooh. Yeah. So I've I've read a lot about Freud. Yep. A lot, a lot, and never, and I actually specifically went to try to find some information about this character studying under him, could not find a single thing. So I'm kind of calling BS on that. And then also, I do yoga three times a week, and I can't read your mind, Mike. (laughs) You can read my face pretty easy, but... Your your face is extraordinarily easy to read. (laughs) Yeah. If Mike feels it, it's on his face. (laughs) Yeah, it definitely is. These unique skills made Langsner a globally sought-after detective. There's speculation, for instance, that he played a role in probing the mysterious death of Lord Carnarvon, believed to be linked to the Curse of the Pharaohs. It was the King Tut thing. He also reportedly connected the controversial case of Maharaja Holkar, accused of orchestrating the murder of his former lover's companion, leading to his abdication. Stories suggest there were many such instances. Langsner claimed that all he required was to be in the same room as a suspect and he could tune in to their thoughts. To use a mic term, oh dear. Oh dear. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) When I find something incredulous, I will say, oh dear. Very much so. Oh dear. According to Ed Butts in his book, Murder, 12 Stories of Homicide in Canada, Henry Boer was staying at the Manville Hotel when Inspector Hancock brought Langsner to meet him. This decision proved to be ill-advised. Given the traumatic events, the murder of his wife and eldest son and his younger son being the prime suspect, Henry was in no state to entertain someone claiming to read minds. Upon their entry into his room, an agitated Henry promptly grabbed Langsner and forcibly ejected him from the room using a technique familiar to bouncers. After this encounter, Dr. Langsner refrained from trying to approach Henry again. Despite this setback, Langsner remained resolute in his quest to uncover the whereabouts of the missing rifle. He requested a visit to the Boer farm. While there, he briefly surveyed the vacant structures, but didn't venture into the fields. He later asserted that during this visit, he wanted to inspect a group of trees roughly 130 yards west of the barn. However, he didn't act on this inclination then and instead proceeded to the Stevenson residence. At the Stevenson house, Langsner took a moment to dramatically touch the rack where the rifle had been taken and then the cupboard that once held the ammunition. Feeling he had gathered all the information he could from the location, he headed back to Manville. He aimed to board the train to Edmonton, coincidentally the same one transporting Vernon Boer to an Edmonton prison. 
On his return to Edmonton, Langsner then asked to be alone with Vernon Boer. He sat in a chair near Vernon's cell, staring at him, not uttering a word. After a short while, he came to Chief Inspector Hancock and told him, quote, You don't have to deal with the ear. He's guilty. He confessed to me. The inspector explained that a wordless confession would not stand up in court and asked him again to search for a weapon. So Langsner returned to the chair near the cell bars and stared at the detainee silently. After five hours, he got up and asked the police to take him to the Boer place. He had a rough sketch he'd drawn from Vernon Boer's thought waves and said he'd find the gun for them. Okay, so he's, he was alone with this guy and he said that not a word was spoken. Hmm. Let me put on the record here that I call bullshit. Well, who knows? This is the way it's been presented throughout the years, so I'm assuming there were people watching this the whole time. Who knows how close they were or whether or not Langsner allowed them to be in the same room? I don't really know. Mm. Yeah. Shortly after, with the sketch in hand, the police and mentalist returned to the Boer farm. After some initial wandering around, Langsner said he felt compelled to head in a certain direction. When they reached a location around 235 meters from the home along the path that Vernon took to the Ross farm, they found some shrubs and the missing 303 rifle hidden beneath one of the shrubs. The crime lab in Edmonton linked an empty shell found in the kitchen sink to the imprint of the weapon's firing pin. So it was definitely the gun that was used. Yeah, I like how this is... Um <laughs> the story that like the research y- you did connected this guy to like th- the the gun was f- found by the mentalist who had thought waves and i'm like mm-hmm. who would have thought that a murder weapon could be thrown into the bushes along a path that a murderer used i find it a little bit um not that believable that it was because quote he, he had psychic information The problem with this is, and I'm playing devil's advocate, I'm not saying I believe any of this, but the problem with this is that area had been scoured quite heavily by other people searching. So it's it's interesting why it wasn't found at that time. Who knows? Yeah, but that that, that happens often, doesn't it? Remember, like the Carla Homolka tapes that were found in the house after they scoured it, right? They, They, people often miss stuff. Well, they were found by the lawyer because Paul told them that they were there hmm. and where he'd hidden them up in a light fixture. But and, and I think that's what's happening here. Yeah. When presented with the rifle, Vernon Boer appeared taken aback and inquired if any fingerprints had been identified on it. Vernon confessed the following day. He told the police, quote, I want to get it all over with. I don't care if I'm hanged tomorrow. I killed Mother as she sat at the table and then shot my brother Fred as he rushed into the house to see what was happening. The two of them were lying in the house when Counselor Scott called. I don't know what I would have done if he had attempted to enter the house. When Bill came in from the field, I shot him in the barn so that he would not find the other bodies. Gabriel Gromby, I shot in the bunkhouse. I had planned to sink his body in 15 feet of water and throw the rifle in after him, but I did not have time. Sounds like he wanted to frame Gabriel. Mother and Fred's constant nagging of me about a girl I'm crazy about was the cause of the whole thing. I had it planned out for some time. I am making this confession because I want to get it over with, and I don't want father and my sisters to have to appear in court. He concluded, showing no remorse, well, it's done. I might as well get it all over with, end quote. The only death he lamented was his brother's. The deaths of the farm workers were of little consequence to him. He was so enamored of the girl who had worked at a local hospital that he feigned injuries and illnesses to get out of his chores and see her. On hearing that Langsner had led police to the gun without speaking a word to Vernon Boer, people were floored. How had he done it? Could he really read minds? Some people believed so. The story got a lot of attention. Langsner seemed modest about the whole affair. He said he could merely tune in to Vernon Boer's thought waves, and that's how he'd drawn the map. Langsner told the Edmonton Journal, quote, All the credit is due to the energetic and marvelous work of the Alberta Provincial Police. I am an honorary member of the majority of police forces of the world, but I have never worked with a more efficient police organization than that which you have here. 
Commissioner Bryan and Detective Sergeant Leslie of the APP are among the best criminologists that I have ever met. Their efficient work made my little part exceedingly easy. They had all the important data ready at hand, and all I did was find the missing link in the chain of evidence, end quote. Wow, he's really great at PR, isn't he? Yeah, well, he wants to do the job again, I guess, so... <laughs> Say that the people you work with are great and other people will want to work with you. Exactly. Funny how that works. As Vernon was now going on trial for his life, he relinquished control of his defense to some more seasoned representation. Lawyer N.D. McLean, acting on Vernon Boer's behalf, sought to have his confession thrown out, claiming Langsner had hypnotized Vernon into confessing against his will. In a court hearing presided over by Magistrate C.J. Simmons, the Crown sought to admit an alleged confession from this defendant. The situation was unique, with no available precedence. The Crown had to prove that the confession was voluntary. Generally, everyone is presumed sane and capable of making decisions unless proven otherwise. Dr. Langsner had identified himself as a criminologist and claimed to be able to extract information using unconventional methods, such as feeling a person's thoughts, hinting at some form of hypnotism. Dr. Pope, a professor of medicine at the University of Alberta, testified about the lasting effects of hypnotism, suggesting that its influence could linger even after the hypnotist's interaction with the subject. Langsner, of course, was called to the stand. Dr. Langsner said he had no direct conversation with the defendant, but visited him intending to locate a rifle used in the murder, which it seems he had been able to do. Subsequent visits by Dr. Langsner to Vernon Boer aimed to obtain a confession from him. Shortly after one of these visits, Vernon expressed a desire to speak with Detective Leslie and subsequently confessed. Langsner's testimony was dramatic. Can you hypnotize a man? asked Neil McLean. If necessary, was the reply, I could hypnotize you immediately. So I put a note here for me to do a verbal eye roll. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I, he turned me into a chicken immediately. Oh, we get into chickens actually in a little bit. So. Oh, do we? Oh, yeah. Just further down. <laughs> About his visit to Vernon Boer, Langsner said, quote, all I wanted was to feel his thoughts, if I can explain it that way. You can read his mind, E.B. Cogswell, the Crown Prosecutor asked. Oh, perhaps you would call it guessing or a hunch. You would have found the gun if you had gone in the same direction as I did. Did you know that the gun was there before you saw it, asked Cogswell. No, said Langsner. Finally, E.B. Cogswell asked Langsner what everyone was wondering. Did you at any time hypnotize Boer? Never replied Langsner. Given the circumstances, the court was skeptical about the methods used by Dr. Langsner. Although he had denied using hypnotism, the sequence of events raised doubts about the genuineness of his methods. The court concluded that the Crown had not sufficiently proven that the defendant's confession was free from external mental influence. As a result, the court decided not to admit the entire confession. Vernon's trial continued without the Crown benefiting from that confession. They still had the murder weapon and a pile of circumstantial evidence. So, it went forward. On September 28th, Chief Justice Simmons summarized a high-profile murder case for the jury, emphasizing their role in upholding justice. In a swift decision, Vernon Boer was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to hang on December 15th, 1928. However, after reviewing the 400-page trial transcript, Neil McLean identified grounds for a retrial based on the jury's lack of context regarding a confession. The appellate division set a new trial for January 21, 1929. In the second trial, the evidence was re-examined with Dr. Langsner's involvement becoming contentious. Vernon's demeanor shifted, especially when statements he allegedly made to jail guards were presented. The most impactful testimony came from Warden John McLean, who claimed Vernon had confessed, expressing remorse for two deaths but indifference toward his family members. McLean suggested that the motive was a disagreement over a girl Vernon was seeing. Despite challenges to McLean's delayed testimony, the collective evidence painted a picture of Vernon's guilt. 
Neil McLean suggested Dr. Langsner manipulated Vernon's confessions, emphasizing the weak evidence against Vernon until the doctor's involvement, and McLean questioned the legitimacy of the rifle Dr. Langsner claimed to have found. Justice Walsh regretted Dr. Langsner's role in the case and highlighted the significance of Vernon's confession to Warden McLean. After a five-hour deliberation, the jury found Vernon guilty, and Judge Walsh sentenced him to death again. When asked by the judge for comment, Vernon said the evidence given against him was false, and he reiterated his innocence. While awaiting execution, Vernon was evaluated by Dr. James McKay. In this session, Vernon offered yet another confession detailing the events leading up to the murders and his actions afterward. He expressed no remorse for his actions, and the mystery of the rifle's extended disappearance remains unresolved. Langsner went on to attempt to solve the disappearance of Toronto millionaire Ambrose Small, which we covered in episode 213 of Dark Poutine. He attracted the wrong kind of attention in Toronto in December 1928. A doctor from Vancouver came forward claiming the strange little man from Vienna was a fraud, which the Toronto Police Department followed up on. I totally forgot about that episode. This is the same dude. Yep. Okay. According to the Ottawa Citizen, records indicated that Langsner wasn't a legitimate doctor, and that his self-proclaimed affiliation with the Master of Latent Light cult was fictitious. He faced charges for deceitfully obtaining money. He was expelled from several European nations due to his dubious hypnotic acts, which he falsely advertised as remedies for various conditions. Dr. H. Gessner from Vancouver provided a detailed report on Langsner revealing his criminal history in Austria and his known activities in Yokohama and Kobe, Japan. In Asia, Langsner showcased his hypnotic abilities in vaudeville shows, but his supposed treatments often failed, leading to his expulsion from these regions. In 1921, he faced legal consequences in Vienna for misusing hypnotism, and Dr. Jessner's investigations also revealed Langsner's true origins in Romania and the subsequent change of nationality to Polish during political shifts in Romania. Langsner's ventures in Java and India were marred by controversies, including endangering a patient's life and being denied performance permissions respectively. Dr. Gessner's final remarks on Langsner were that he was morally and academically unqualified to practice hypnotism, accusing him of exploiting it for personal profit. Reports from Japan's police department indicated that Langsner was charged with the unauthorized practice of medicine in Kobe, but was allowed to leave the country without facing trial. Toronto Police Chief Draper received information from Berlin police that Langsner, originally from Madwarma, Romania, and born on June 14, 1893, was not a certified doctor. While he had no criminal record in Germany, he was sought after in Austria for fraud and had faced penalties for assault and defamation. In Poland, he was recognized by the stage name Karaiki. Scotland Yard had no records of Langsner defrauding people in Britain. Uh, there you go. Yeah. A good old uh, snake oil salesman. But it's it's interesting, like a lot of the other stories that I read don't really get into this story about Langsner being a fraud. They just tend to say, well, he read Vernon's mind. Maybe he deduced some things, but I don't think <laughs> there was much mind reading going on. Yeah, that was probably just lazy journalism. A lot of times I think it's just people saying, well, let's keep this sensational and not debunk ourselves kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. We see that a lot. Let's tell a story about a mystic who read a mind. Yeah. Well, you see that in YouTube videos where people are out ghost hunting and using different tools. Morgan and I talk about this on uh, Supernatural Circumstances, and we talked about it with our uh, recent guest, Lloyd Auerbach. This was after we stopped recording. He said he and a friend took apart some of the tools that people use, and one of them is just simply a theremin. That has been <laughs> repurposed. So you get close to it, it makes a noise kind of thing. So Okay. Vernon was hanged at the Fort Saskatchewan jail on the morning of April 24th, 1929. The trap was sprung at 440 and Boer was declared dead at 450. On the eve of his execution, Vernon told his lawyer, Neil McLean, that Langsner had not hypnotized him. 
McLean told the press what Vernon had said. Quote, he came to me in the cell and told me he was a doctor and that he was there to help me. I thought he was sent by my friends and I told him where he could find the rifle. I even drew a diagram for him so that he could find it. I thought he was going to hide it or throw it in the river, but he double-crossed me. Langsner is a fake. He couldn't hypnotize a sick chicken. He's a double-crosser, that's all, end quote. So was it the truth? Had Langsner somehow had Vernon draw him the diagram used to find the gun? Or was this a last-ditch effort by Vernon to save his life? We'll never know. I mean, Vernon did confess to the crimes numerous times and then recant. Confess, recant, confess, recant. And this is after his trial, too, so... And he also said here that he drew a map of where it was. So that, to me, is... it's it, it, If he's drawing... If he's admitting that he drew a map because he thought the doctor could help him, right? So I, I drew a diagram... I'm going to cut you off here because... I don't think that's really a good debunker because he was aware that the doctor had had a map by this time. So he could just be lying again to save his life and saying, it was me who drew the map. Yeah, but why But why would he say he drew a map to where the gun is if, if he's trying to say he's innocent and wouldn't have known where the gun is? Right. <laughs> so, oh, I gotcha. So he's dumb. <laughs> he's dumb or he's just pissed off that that he was he was double crossed right where he's like oh this doc doctor was trying to say okay i'll find the gun i'll figure it out and and lo and behold he double crossed me and and actually yeah i think the guy went in there he probably has powers of persuasion right in terms of right of of being because obviously he's traveled the world doing this and he kind of like hey i'm here to help you out just show me where the gun is i'll get rid of it show me it give me a map gave him a map boom yeah Vernon's sisters felt he was framed for the killings and died believing that their brother was innocent. Some historians who later reviewed the case have wondered if, perhaps, they were right. In more modern cases in Canada, the use of hypnotism, particularly in the context of criminal investigations and legal proceedings, has raised several legal concerns. The primary issue concerns the reliability of memories or statements obtained under hypnosis, Given that hypnosis can heighten suggestibility, there's a risk of producing false or distorted memories spontaneously or due to leading questions. Moreover, the hypnotic process might introduce or suggest new information to a person's memory, blurring the lines between genuine and implanted recollections. Consequently, Canadian courts are often reluctant to admit testimony from previously hypnotized witnesses. This stance was solidified in the landmark R. V. Trocom case in 2007, where the Supreme Court of Canada deemed such evidence inadmissible in criminal trials. Furthermore, confessions made under hypnosis might be considered involuntary or unreliable, giving the potential for manipulation or pressure during the hypnotic state. The lack of standardized training and regulation for those using hypnosis in a forensic setting further complicates its acceptance. While hypnosis may have value in therapeutic contexts, its role in the Canadian legal system is limited due to these challenges. And boy, am I ever glad of that. <laughs> I've seen hypnotists. I, I saw Ravine multiple times when I was a kid, and that guy had people doing crazy things, swimming away from the Titanic and all that kind of thing. Mm. So I guess, like, admitting to a murder might be an easy thing to do if you're hypnotized. Yeah, it's... uh. I, I think that uh, the Mr. Big People should get together with the hypnotist people and do Mr. Hypnotist. And and we should rely on that for an, our Can Canadian legal system. Sure. We don't have to worry about facts or proof. Yeah, that's what I want, somebody reading my mind. I want entrapment and hypnotism. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> and that's it for Dark Poutine episode 286, The Mind Reader and the Murderer. The Boer Farm Massacre. It feels like we need that ear music. I agree. Oh, dear. That's right, it's time for voicemails. 
you can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. So here is our first voicemail, and there's only one this week, so it's the first and the last. Let's have a listen. Oh my gosh, I got the biggest smile on my face right now. I wanted to tell you, my mother was born in Fort Francis, Ontario, and we were driving down a street that had the county jail. And she said there was a hanging in there when I was a young woman. And the crime was three men tortured and killed a woman on a hot stove in Ontario. And it, the trial was then, the three guys were, was hanged in Fort Francis, Ontario at that time. And I never forgot it. And then when I got into true crime, my mother would tell me all these other murderers, one, Ed Gein, and every time I went through Gein, there's a town in Minnesota, I should say, we're coming to Gein, and I would duck in, my, in the car. Thank you. I love you guys. You are my number one podcast. Thanks again. Both pucka in your hat. Oh, <laughs> oh that was sweet. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like mom was really into true crime. Holy smokes. Yeah, she handed it from mother to daughter, handing down yeah. the stories. Well, it was like my grandmother. She liked that stuff, too. She she loved the stories, uh, the dark stories. She didn't really talk to me that much about it, but she had lots of true crimey stuff laying around, <laughs> like the Max Haynes articles and all that kind of thing. So Wow. Yeah. So what do you think this person does, Matthew? She didn't tell us her name, but she's from Fort Francis, Ontario, which is... Uh, a town that I'm familiar with. I had some former relatives from there. So, uh, well, yeah. I, I, I think with that early introduction to true, true crime, she's a criminal profiler. Okay. Okay. That's, that sounds fun. But, uh, she has, she, as a, as a youngster, it sounds like she was a little terrified of them, uh, ducking yeah. when they went through, yeah. Bean, for example. But the, the, this is how she overcame that fear. She's like, I'm going to profile them and find them so I don't have to be afraid. Well, that's why I do, that's why I love horror, and that's why I love true crime, and that's why I have all kinds of books on death, because those are things I'm terrified of. <laughs> this is how I deal with it. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Let's move on to patrons and donut money donors. We don't have any donut money donors this week, but we do have some patrons and some interesting ones. First up, we have Nicole, or Nikki, Granger, and she's from McLeansville, North Carolina. What does Nikki do there in McLeansville, Matthew? In McLeansville, mm -hmm. she she uh, is a sales rep for McLean's magazine from Canada, and she's okay. trying to make it a she's trying to make it a popular magazine in in America as well. I I'm sure that'll go over well with like stories about Pierre Burton and <laughs> and the tragically <laughs> and things yeah, that the, I, the Americans have never heard of. I think McLean's would not do well at all in the United States. It's very specific, isn't it? <laughs> it would definitely would not. <laughs> uh, next up is a, a super interesting one. There's there's two people, well, or okay. two individuals in this group uh, who are now patrons, and it is Alex plus Snips the Duck. Oh, Snips the Duck. <laughs> And they, they are paying in Swedish krona, so we know they're from somewhere in Sweden. Okay. Which is interesting. Um, so <laughs> Alex and Snips the Duck. So where in Sweden are they, number one? Where in Sweden are they? 
Yeah. In a very, on a very small island. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the name. You don't, you probably can't pronounce it. No, but it's a very small island. Did you notice that Sweden has like lots of little islands? It does. Yeah. Yeah. So they're on a very small island in Sweden, which, you know, probably works out for Snips the Duck. Uh, But what do they do there? Alex does duck yoga. Alex does duck yoga. Oh, interesting. So yoga for ducks. I've seen goat yoga. So it's it's similar to that. No, she teaches ducks and ducklings how to do yoga. Oh, so it's not like just people with ducks on their backs. It is uh, actual no. ducks doing yoga. Yeah. Well, it's good for a for a duck to be limber as well. So. Well, then, you know, they want that inner duck zen, you know? Right. <laughs> duck sure. zen. Her, duck her zen. yoga, her studio is called duck zen. Duck zen. So, uh, yeah. Copyright. Dark Poutine, twenty twenty three. Duck Zen. Yeah, it's anyway. a growth. It's a, it's a growth market. I'm telling you. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Uh, thank you, so Alex. Thank you, Alex and, and Snips. S- and Snips. I I wonder if Snips is called Snips because it takes like little snips at your hand with his beak. Probably. <laughs> Probably. Next, we have Melissa Mercier, and uh, I'm. I'm going to take a wild, wild guess and think that Melissa is somewhere in Francophone Canada. Just a wild guess. Yeah. Yeah, she's, I think so. She, yeah, uh, she's, she's from um, uh, Beckencore. Beckencore. Oh, interesting. Yep. Yep. There's a Beckencore in Europe, too. So, um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I I only know that from watching my World War II movies. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what does Melissa do there in Beckencore, Matthew? Well, actually, Melissa is helping to build uh, one of the world's largest um, uh, battery factories for uh, uh, electric cars. Oh, that's good. Uh, I mean, we need those, and hopefully they're not explodey ones. But uh, no, they're not explodey ones. And this is kind of based on fact. There's a massive uh, factory being built right now in Beckencore. There is, yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. interesting to see that uh, um, a lot of electric car batteries are going to be made here in Canada. I'm kind of curious how that's going to work out. Are we going to make like... them for? Yeah, Go we're going to make them. We're going to make them for a lot of countries, actually. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. So we have we uh, just just before we go, we're done with with patrons. We're done with our donut money donors. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. But just before we go, I want to talk about what's upcoming. So there are five five different. Mondays in October. And as October is a fun kind of month for us, and it's our sixth anniversary as a show on the 31st. So the show, the, the show drops before the day before I was thinking, let's do spooktober. So we'll have five spooky episodes and, uh, sure there'll be all kinds of different stuff, but There'll be five spookier kind of episodes for Spooktober. Thoughts? <laughs> oh, you wanted me to. You yeah, wanted me to respond I, I, to it. It's a converse, this is a conversational podcast, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was sitting here going, okay. I was literally sitting here going, oh, that sounds cool. <laughs> So it was in my head. I'm looking forward to what episodes those are going to be. Yeah, I've got them sort of all planned out. Um, mm. But but yeah, I'm really looking forward to doing a bit a bit a bit more spooky stuff for Spooktober. It's the yeah. season, you know, it, pumpkin it, spice it, and all that kind. Of, yeah, 
pumpkin spice and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do some more spooky, spooky things. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for this episode of Dark Poutine. Until next time, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Fin. Fini. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Donezo. Donezo.